Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you for attending our webinar today. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to go over. Um, as the title screen here says, you know, this webinar is about understanding the USP 800 standards in the community pharmacy. Um, I am Joshua Potter, Director of Compliance here at PRS Pharmacy Services. Um, if you have any questions in, during today's webinar, you can use the GoToMeeting uh, client software to ask those questions. And at the end of the webinar, I will go over those. Um, you know, if we if we reach the allotted uh, amount of time, I will um, we will be sending out a uh, email with the, the the questions and the answers. Uh, so if I do not get to your question uh, or I do not have a chance to get to any questions, um, everybody will receive a, a copy. Everybody on the webinar today will receive a copy of those questions and the answers to those in the answer to those questions. So uh, in today's webinar, I'm going to go over uh, a couple different things. First, the September 23rd uh, uh, announcement that USP made postponing uh, USP 795 and 797, or at least the new versions, the 2019 versions of 795 and 797, and uh, you know what that kind of means. Um, what that means for you and also what it may not mean for you. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions when it does come to who actually needs to be compliant with uh, USP 800. That covers the second one there, or even required to be compliant. Um, and then also go over what is a hazardous drug. Then I'm going to go over um, each of the 18 uh, uh, sections of the USP 800 standards uh, that, that USP has in place uh, when it comes to the handling of hazardous drugs. And then I'm going to cover up go over what your next steps need to be um, to actually uh, uh, become USP compliant, USP 800 compliant. So um, as many of you probably already know, but I'm going to go over it anyways, you know, there's a, a, a link between USP 795, 797, and 800. Uh, prior to a couple of years ago, or even actually as, as of today, uh, the current version of 795, which is the 2014 version, and the 2008 version of 797 have the hazardous drug requirements kind of built into them. Um, a couple years ago, USP came out with the USP 800 standards, which, um, as a draft, were really going to be taking over that hazardous drug handling uh, when it came to uh, the handling of hazardous drugs in healthcare setting. Um, and as most of you also know, back in September 2017, USP delayed the initial um, official date for USP 800 because of some incompatibilities with 795 and 797. Um, now. In 20, June of 2019, USP issued new standards for 795 and 797. Uh, however, uh, those standards um, had some uh, issues when it came to beyond use dating in a couple other areas that um, uh, USP received a lot of questions and concerns uh, and an appeal for the new versions of 795 and 797. So on September 23rd, they basically postponed the new versions of 795 and 797 uh, as they kind of go through an internal review to uh, uh, take a, a look at these, the beyond use dating standard and a couple other areas of the, of the new versions of 795 and 797. But one thing to realize is um, while they did delay 795 and 797, that does not necessarily mean that USP 800 is delayed. Um, I kind of go over what you need to be looking at to see what this actually does mean to you and who you need to be looking at to see if they're going to require USP 800 compliance. So, you know, listening to some webinars, listening to some consultants speak, you know, a lot of them make it sound like everybody in the country needs to be USP 800 compliant. That, that is not necessarily the case. Um, you know, one thing to realize is USP itself is not a regulatory body. Um, they, they are just an entity that creates standards and then regulatory bodies and uh, organ accreditation organizations will decide whether or not they're actually going to use those standards. So when it comes to USP, and pharmacy, obviously, we want to look at our state board of pharmacy to see if uh, they're going to require you to be USB 800 compliant. So um, if you're not uh, sure yet if you need to be USB compliant, you definitely want to check with your state board of pharmacy. And, as, and when you check with them, you want to ask a couple different questions. Um, are they only requiring USB 800 compliant for compounders, or are they requiring compliance for non-compounders also? And if they are going to require, if they do require um, uh, compliance with the USP 800, when is the effective date of that compliance, um, and also if, you know, for the effective date, um, whether you can request or waiver or delay of enforcement. Um, you know, some states already come out and say we're not going to enforce this for, you know, a year or two years, whatever it may be. Um, and some states that some states that are going through the process of beginning uh, enforcement now, um, you can actually contact them um, and they can 
you can request a waiver or delay uh, of enforcement for a period of time. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I also want to check with your pharmacy accreditation organizations, um, whether this is, you know, ACHC, uh, the Joint Commission, uh, URAC, or, or whoever it may be, to check if they're going to require USB 800 compliance. Uh, and again, you want to check to make sure that, uh, to see who they are actually requiring to be compliant, you know, compounders only, uh, sterile compounders only, or do they require everybody? Uh, less likely, though, you may see that some payers may eventually go down this route. Uh, we have not seen any yet um, that are requiring USB 800 compliance, but it is something that um, uh, that we may see in the future. And then also your workers' comp insurance. This is someone who uh, uh, may uh, may require you to be uh, USB 800 compliance. I, I, I again, I haven't heard of any that are requiring this. You know, one thing to realize is, you know, there is the OSHA hazard communication standard, uh, you know, which, which all employers need to follow, and that is something that um, you're going to have to be compliant with, whether or not you need to be USB 800 compliant. Uh, so those workers' compensation insurance or workers' comp insurances will definitely be looking at that. Uh, and when I say workers' comp, I don't mean the ones we bill for uh, patients when they come into pharmacy. I mean your own business insurance. Another area that we see a little bit of confusion on is, you know, again, what does the FDA require and what does OSHA require? Um, now, both of these responses here, these quotes here, are responses that we did receive from uh, the FDA and OSHA. Um, you know, when it comes to the FDA, um, basically what they said was, you know, as an initial matter, please be aware that FDA has not issued any enforcement policy uh, that ref refers to the standards in USP 800 itself. Uh, now, that being said, those pharmacies that are required to be 503A and 503B compliant, um, you know, when the new versions of USP 795 and 797 are finally uh, finalized and released, um, those versions will most likely, well, not most likely, those versions will require USP 800 compliance uh, for any pharmacy that needs to be compliant with 795 and 797. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what the FDA does decide to do when it comes to that. And then for OSHA itself, um, you know, OSHA basically said, you know, pharmacy just needs to comply with the hazard communication standard and you're going to be meeting the, the OSHA regulations themselves. Um, so in general, if you've contacted your state board of pharmacy, you contacted uh, any accreditation organizations you may have, and they said you don't need to be compliant with USP 800, then you want to make sure that you uh, you are compliant. You need to make sure that you um, are compliant with the hazard communication standard uh, in any state, local, or federal EPA rules that may be in place that are um, kind of above and beyond what uh, the OSHA 800 does require. Next, I want to talk about um, the hazardous drugs themselves. Um, now, USP itself uh, provides a definition of what they classify as hazardous drugs, and there's an organization called NIOSH uh, that actually publishes a list of these hazardous drugs. Um, now, for the USP definition, um, you, know, you can kind of see it here. Uh, any drug identified by at least one of the following criteria, you can you know, read it there on your screen. Um, you know, and, and basically, these are um, any, um, any drugs that they consider to be hazardous. Now, I mentioned NIOSH. You know, NIOSH is National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, they maintain a list of all the antineoplastic and other hazardous drugs uh, that are used in healthcare. Now, they break these drugs down to uh, three different groups, at least as of today, they break it down to three different groups. Group one, two, and three are the anti-neoplastic, the non-anti-neoplastic, and those with only a reproductive risk. Now, uh, the anti-neoplastic and non-anti-neoplastic may have reproductive risk also, but they also have other risks that are uh, beyond just reproductive risk. Um, Currently, um, there is a NIOSH document entitled the NIOSH List of Antineoplastic and Other Hazardous Drugs in Healthcare Settings. Uh, that is currently dated at 2016. There's a link to the, uh, or the web address uh, for the actual document itself. Uh, there have been some supplemental additions and deletions to that list, uh, I believe about four or five uh, since 2016. Now, the next edition of the NIOSH list of hazardous drugs should be released sometime this month. It's about, uh, initially it was supposed to be released in 2018, um, but it was delayed for one reason or another until 2019. So they haven't released as of this morning when I checked, but um, um, they, they will be releasing a new list. And I, I know as according to the 2017 notice they put out for the review request, I believe there were about 44 drugs they were looking at that date uh, in 2017 uh, for addition into the list. Um, 
so now I want to actually take a look over the standards themselves or the sections themselves um, for USP 800. Now, uh, section one, the introduction and scope. This is really just a broad overview of the standards. It kind of talks about what entities uh, should be compliant, and that includes pharmacies, and also what kind of individuals you need to be training on uh, the handling of hazardous drugs. And you know, in pharmacy setting, that's going to be anybody that handles those drugs. So pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, whoever's responsible for receiving. Um, if you have uh, individuals that are responsible for uh, waste management, things like that, you know, they may all they may all be exposed to hazardous drugs. So it kind of you know goes over uh, that, and then also in st section one, it kind of makes a list of all the other uh, sections uh, that 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 USP 800 has. It's not really uh, that informative, but it gives you a list of it. All right, so obviously you need to have a list of all your hazardous drugs. Section two goes over that requirement. Uh, so in section two, they're going to be doing a couple different things. You're going to be doing a couple different things. First, you're going to make a list of all the hazardous drugs you have in the pharmacy. So basically, you're going to take a look at your inventory, and then you're going to compare that to that NIOSH uh, list of hazardous drugs. Um, you also will be inspecting any new products as they come into the pharmacy, and you're going to check to make sure that new product isn't something that is on that NIOSH list or that it's not structurally similar to something that is on the NIOSH list itself. Uh, so you want to do that as new products come in, and then you want to review that list at least every 12 months uh, to ensure that um, nothing's been missed. And, you know, once you kind of create that list, you're going to have a very good perspective on uh, all the hazardous drugs that your pharmacy uses and where you're really going to uh, start uh, uh, focusing on USP 800 compliance. Now section two also has uh, a section in there related to something called the assessment of risk. Now as you go through um, USP 800, you're going to find uh, all these requirements for uh, specific containment requirements or uh, specific handling requirements, whether that's personal protective equipment and so forth, um, that are required or USP recommends, uh, well, say requires, we'll start with that, requires for uh, certain activities when it comes to handling hazardous drugs. Um, now, for certain drugs, you can create something called this assessment of risk, um, and you're going to do this for any hazardous drugs that you believe do not pose a significant risk of exposure, you know, based on their dosage form. Now, USP 800 doesn't go into um, actually define what that really means, you know, um, but, uh, you know, what does a significant risk of exposure actually mean? Um, but in general, you are allowed to create this thing called assessment of risk, and what you're going to do in this is basically create um, an alternative handling or containment practice uh, for the use of certain hazardous drugs. Now, you cannot do these on any sort of hazardous drug active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, uh, basically the, the products you're using during the compounding process, but um, and you cannot use it on any, any anti-neoplastic drugs that you may that may require manipulation, and that's going to include the splitting of tablets, opening of capsules, uh, crushing of tablets, uh, reconstitution of anti-neoplastic medication. You may add, you know, adding water to it or uh, alcohol to it or whatnot. Um, you know, anything that's considered manipulation, you're not going to be able to do that if it's an anti-neoplastic or one of those group one drugs. Now, the assessment of risk itself is going to need to contain some uh, very specific items. Uh, first, it's going to need to have the name of the drug on it. Uh, the dosage form. Um, so if it's a tablet, a capsule, you know, they're all going to be a little bit different. So um, if you have a drug that comes in multiple formats, uh, multiple forms, you know, the, the overall practice may be a little bit different and you may do an assessment of risk on one, uh, but not the other. Um, the packaging, what kind of packages that come in, um, you know, it's coming glass, plastic, a bag, you know, probably not too many bags anymore, but um, you know, what, what kind of packaging does it come in? Because that's also going to dictate how you're going to ha have your, uh, uh, employees handle it. Um, the risk of exposure, what is that overall risk? You know, whether it's um, a risk of, you know, a pill uh, uh, releasing powder, capsule releasing powder, what kind of overall exposure is, uh, is happening, and then what kind of manipulation or activity is performed on that drug. Now, if you do not do an assessment of risk on a medication, you need to just follow some, uh, just the standard uh, pharmaceutical practice. Basically, you need to follow everything else that uh, USP 800 says, but you know, a lot of cases for your average dispensing pharmacy, um, you're probably going to be creating a lot of assessment of risks when it comes to um, uh, the the practice of dispensing uh, these drugs. You know, think about uh, whether it's warfarin or Paxil or uh, carbamazepine or something like that. You know, the overall risk uh, to your employees may be somewhat uh, limited, so you are going to do assessment of risks so they don't need to go through the process of, you know, donning all the appropriate personal protective equipment and so forth.
Uh, when you do create the assessment of risk, you want to make sure that you review them every 12 months and make sure your employees are aware of those and, and they know to uh, speak up when uh, uh, they believe an assessment of risk is uh, uh, inappropriate in that situation, whether it's that activity or that particular form or any other uh, uh, section of that assessment of risk is uh, uh, somewhat um, that they, they believe is not fully protecting them. Um, you know, so with that assessment of risk, that's you know they put it in section two, but it is really something that that should be in a section further along, because as of by section two, you've you've really just identified your drugs. In section three, you're also gonna uh, you're gonna start taking a look at the actual um, uh, uh, potential exposure activities that are going to expose your employees um, uh, to hazardous drugs. So USP does define uh, a couple different areas where um, there may be potential exposure, you know, receipt of the drug. So when the drug actually comes into the pharmacy, uh, the dispensing of the drug. So you're counting and packaging a drug. Um, and that's typically, you know, in final dosage forms, whether that's um, counting uh, capsules, uh, tablets, or even uh, reconstituting uh, uh, some medications uh, or, you know, dispensing creams and ointments and things like that that may be hazardous. Then it goes over the compounding and other manipulation, you know, compounding, you know, we all know what that is, but then manipulation is going to be um, uh, when you're splitting crushing tablets and things like that. Uh, administration, you know, most pharmacies aren't going to be doing this, um, but, um, you know, that, that's actually administering the, the drug to the patient. So if you are injecting a patient uh, or you are providing a patient with um, uh, the pills for them to take there in the pharmacy, you know, that's the administration process. In those situations, you want to make sure, that, again, that your, um, you know, your employees are, are properly protected. Uh, patient care activities, again, not something that's going to happen in most pharmacies um, or any pharmacies that I know of, but may happen in a uh, more of a uh, clinical setting uh, where, again, you're administering those drugs and there's a chance that uh, the patient themselves may spill the, the drug on them um, in the process of basically cleaning that patient off, making sure that, um, again, personal protective equipment is, is worn in, in any sort of um, uh, products that may have, hazardous drugs that may have uh, spilled on the patient themselves or um, uh, disposed of in the uh, proper uh, way. Also, spills, self-explanatory transport. Um, you know, when, you know, we're going to be transporting these drugs in the pharmacy itself. So when they come into the pharmacy, you receive them, you're going to transport them to the storage area. And also, if you ever have to mail or ship drugs out. So if you are uh, mailing hazardous drugs out to the patients, um, you want to make sure that you have a proper uh, practice in place to actually handle that and that you are following, um, you know, the carrier rules, whether that's uh, the post office, FedEx or UPS, and then waste, basically how are you going to handle the disposal of hazardous waste, and that's something that's really, um, you know, pharmacies are going to have to partner with hazardous waste companies to to properly uh, dispose of these wastes, whether it's to make sure they're compliant with the federal EPA or any state and local EPA. So, as with any compliance program set of standards, you know, you need to have someone who's responsible for that, They're responsible for the overall pharmacy practice, and also make sure your employees are, uh, understand their responsibilities. So USB and HERN is no different. Um, obviously, you're going to need to designate someone or a group of people who are going to be responsible for implementing and maintaining your actual compliance. Uh, for your average independent pharmacy, this will be, you know, one or two individuals. Um, if you're a chain or a multi-store, you may have them work together, may have uh, a group of individuals work together to uh, uh, bring your pharmacy into USP 800 compliance. Now, this designated person, um, you know, they, they are people they need to be um, you know they need to be aware of the actual um, uh, the actual drugs the actual standards so you want to make sure they read the USB 800 uh, standards make sure they're aware of all the drugs on the NIOSH list and what drugs actually exist in the pharmacy make sure they're aware of the pharmacy work practices um, you know they need to they need to understand how these drugs actually move throughout the pharmacy and then make sure that they're aware of you know any other state and federal laws that may be applicable to that patient or to that pharmacy excuse me um, you know there may be some states out there that they may have regulations that go above and beyond what USP 800 requires uh, or if it's you know for the disposal of medication uh, hazardous waste you know make sure that um, they're aware of you know what those rules are and again that goes back to you know you definitely have to partner with a hazardous waste disposal company to uh, uh, you know, get these medications out of the pharmacy. Um, and, and sometimes when we talk about getting medication out of the pharmacy, it may just making sure that your reverse distributor um, can accept these drugs. 
Now in section five, we start to see, you know, some of the meat and potatoes of the actual activities in, in the pharmacy setting. Um, so in section five, it really talks about the facilities and engineering controls. Now, uh, you know, going starting from the very first, you know, the drugs are received in the pharmacy. So, you know, the products themselves need to be unpacked and received um, in a normal or negative pressure area. Uh, basically, you want to make sure that if um, that there is a spill in a receiving area or there's powder that uh, may have contaminated uh, the bottles themselves, uh, that, you know, it's in a negative pressure, meaning that, you know, the powder um, won't be um, uh, pushed out into the surrounding areas. You know, once you have received that drug, you need to make sure you store it appropriately. And it needs to be stored in a way to prevent spillage or breakage from falls. So, um, you know, if, if you're storing glass or in an area that is uh, prone to earthquakes or something like that, you want to make sure that uh, preferably you have uh, lips on the shelf itself that will prevent a drug from uh, falling off that shelf. And you want to make sure the drugs are not stored on the floor so other things can fall on top of it. Now, when we actually get to the storage part, um, we start to see a, a couple different misconceptions when it comes to the storage, and it's going to be on the next slide here. But for the first storage requirement, if it's an anti-neoplastic hazardous drug and you're going to be do doing something other than counting and repackaging that drug, then that drug needs to be stored. Um, and, and if it's a, a, a compounding ingredient, that needs to be stored uh, away from all your other non-hazardous drugs in a negative pressure area. And that particular area needs to have um, an air change per hour of at least 12. Um, basically, make sure that the area is constantly being filtered out at least 12 times in, uh, an hour. Now, where we see our first or one of our first misconceptions is um, not all hazardous drugs need to be segregated from your inventory. You know, if it's a group one, or excuse me, a group two or group three, the antineoplastic or reproductive risk only, or if it's a final dosage form, so a tablet, a capsule, uh, a cream that you're not going to open, uh, wait, you're not going to open a liquid that you're not going to open, then those can be stored um, uh, with your general inventory. Uh, you do not need to store them separately. Uh, however, if it is a refrigerated antineoplastic hazardous drug, that does need to be stored in a negative pressure area, again, of at least 12 air changes per hour inside a dedicated refrigerator. Um, you know, so again, if, if it is a non-antineoplastic reproductive risk only or a final dosage form of an antineoplastic drug, uh, you may store that with your other inventory. Um, now, you're going to make sure that all of your, we'll get into the uh, I believe it's section 11. Um, you want to always make sure that all your hazardous drugs are properly labeled. Uh, basically, you want your employees to be able to look at a, a, a bottle and know that it's hazardous. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, section 5 also covers the engineering controls when it comes to compounding. Um, so in this first slide here, it talks about non-sterile compounding. And of course, we have our um, you know, our primary engineering control, that's going to be the device itself, um, whether it's a, a cabinet uh, or, or, or a hood or something like that, you know, that does need to be externally vented, which is preferred, or there can be a redundant uh, uh, HEPA filters in a series uh, to help uh, uh, prevent exposure from that. Now, with your primary engineering control, the, the device itself, that needs to be placed in a secondary engineering control, which is the room. Um, now that room itself needs to be externally vented and there needs to be at least 12 air changes per hour at all times um, and have a negative pressure of you know, 0.01 to 0.03 inches of water. Um, now that's for non-sterile compounding. Um, and I'm, I'm not a compounding expert, but those of you that do compounding, um, this should all make sense to you. Um, now for sterile HD compounding, we see a little bit more requirements when it comes to uh, what is actually required. So for hazardous drug compounding, you're, you're going to need an ISO class 7 buffer room with an ISO class 7 anti room. Um, so you're going to need to have that in place. Uh, the primary engineering control, again, this is you know the hood, whatever you're going to be mixing um, the actual compound in. Uh, instead of have instead of the possibility of using a series type of filters, this does need to be externally vented. And then the, uh, the secondary uh, engineering control, uh, that needs to be externally vented. And now we see instead of 12 air changes per hour, we need at least 30 air changes per hour. Uh, but we still maintain that 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 uh, inches of water column at all times. Um, now for uh, maximum beyond use dating, as of right now, um, you're going to be using what is that, whatever is described in the USP 797 requirements. Um, 
Now for an unclassified segregated compounding area, um, you know, we've got a couple different requirements here. You know, the primary engineering control uh, needs to be the same, but the secondary engineering control um, uh, that can be used at 12 air changes per hour, but um, you know it is recommended that you do use that top row there with the ISO 7 uh, buffer rooms and ISO 7 anti rooms. Now in section six, uh, USP goes over the environmental quality and controls. Now, uh, for the most part, this is an optional section, um, and and what section six covers is something called environmental wiping. Um, and this is something that uh, USP recommends is done at, at the initially in at least every six months. And what environmental wiping is, is uh, you, you actually work with a, a lab and they will send you a, uh, basically a footprint that you'll put on, you know, your countertop floors, any work surfaces, and you will uh, put that on there. You will use a wipe to basically wipe down that footprint and then you send it to the lab and the lab will be able to tell you if there's any sort of hazardous drug residue or even hazardous drugs on that wipe itself and that'll give you a very good feel for uh, what kind of hazardous drugs are actually uh, what kind of residue um, and uh, uh, contamination is actually in your area um, you know and this is something that we're probably going to see a lot of uh, compounding pharmacies do that handle hazardous drugs or uh, a lot of hazardous drugs and we may see some dispensing pharmacies do this also that are uh, handling uh, large amounts of uh, hazardous drugs or uh, or handling hazardous drugs that are very toxic. Um, to date, when it comes to environmental, environmental wiping, uh, there are no studies on the effectiveness of this, um, and, and that's right in the USP uh, standard itself. Um, but, you know, it is something, again, they do recommend that you do this, um, especially if you're uh, handling a large amount of uh, hazardous drugs. Now, if you do uh, this and you do detect a measurable amount of contamination, uh, basically you need to start uh, going through your work practices, your trainings, and any other potential factors such as you know, maybe your engineering controls are not doing what they need to be doing. Um, so you need to kind of go through those and, and, and work on those to prevent this from occurring again in the future. And then in you know three months or six months, whatever you may do, um, you know basically do that test again and see if, those, um, see if what you've put in place is actually uh, fixing the issue. So we kind of talked about the facility uh, controls, engineering controls, and things like that. Um, you know, th those are all, um, you know, first line, the first things you need to be doing. Uh, the last line of defense for your employees is going to be that personal protective equipment. You know, so USP goes through and, you know, throughout the standards themselves, it talks about what personal protective equipment is required in, in certain tasks and activities, you know, based on, uh, the, you know, what the type of hazard drug it is and also, you know, what, what activity you're performing. Uh, but there are, are roughly five different types of personal protective equipment that USP recommends depending on those activities. Uh, first, gloves, uh, gowns, head, hair, shoes, and sleeve covers eye and face protection, and respiratory protection. Depending on the activity, USP kind of uh, prescribes what kind of what kind of personal protective equipment that you're going to be you're going to need your employees to be using. Again, um, if you've done an assessment of risk, that may be altered a little bit for certain drugs, uh, but in general, it's going to provide the standard um, requirement for all those personal protect all the personal protective equipment that is required for those activities. Now, with personal protective equipment, uh, basically, if um, uh, if one of these uh, has come in contact with the drug, you need to treat that as if it is contaminated. Uh, it needs to be uh, disposed of appropriately. Again, you want to check with that hazardous waste disposal company to uh, go over what they're actually requiring. Uh, and then your employees themselves, obviously, they're going to need to be appropriately trained on these items. So you're going to have to make sure that they understand how to put on this personal protective equipment and how to remove that personal protective equipment in a fashion that's not going to... Um, uh, inadvertently expose them to the hazardous drug uh, contamination that may be on there. Uh, section eight is some is the hazard communication program. Uh, now the main thing is you're going to be following OSHA's hazard communication standard, which is basically um, this is a this particular requirement is something that you know every employer needs to follow. Uh, but basically, it's basically informing your employees of all the hazardous chemicals and drugs that are in uh, their work environment. Um, it's going to talk about labeling. Uh, make sure that your employees are aware that something is hazardous. Make sure they're aware what what exactly is in that bottle, um, so they know uh, you know kind of where to start when they, if there is a spill or any sort of uh, uh, environmental contamination. 
Also availability, availability of uh, safety data sheets. Um, you know, anytime that you have, uh, you can hazardous chemicals and drugs in your pharmacy or any employment area, uh, you wanna make sure those safety data sheets are available. And those safety data sheets um, are specific to each product. Um, so there's not a generic one, there is a set layout, but you wanna make sure that you get them for the products that you do have on hand. Uh, also training, you know, what to do in certain situations. You want to make sure that your employers are aware of that. And then the notification of the hazards themselves for this particular drugs. A lot of that will be on the SDS sheets, um, but you need to make sure that, you know, your employers are aware of those and they also know where to find those. Um, and then USP itself also requires that, you know, any personnel that are uh, uh, of reproductive capability, they need to kind of confirm in writing that they understand that there is a risk of handling hazardous drugs. You know, there's no way we can uh, completely segregate them from uh, uh, potential exposure. So we just want to make sure that they're aware of that. And, you know, the reason why the pharmacy is putting this in place is really to prevent that exposure. In section nine, it talks about uh, personnel training. You know, when we talk about training, there's a couple different things. First, there's a training itself, and then there's um, a competency. Um, basically, every pharmacy is gonna need, need to make sure that their employees that uh, are trained on the handling of hazardous drugs, whether that's the handling or the cleanup process, uh, if there is a spill or disposal or, or whatnot, um, that they can actually uh, prove they're competent to do that. So, you know, the first thing you're going to do is, you know, make sure you train the employees on, uh, you know, what are the what are your hazardous drugs in the pharmacy setting. Um, you're going to review your all of your policies and procedures related to the handling of the hazardous drugs. You know, so you do need to have a standard operating practice uh, or procedures for uh, these for your USB and our compliance. So you need to make sure you have that, you know, written down and available for your employees to uh, use. Uh, how to use personal protective equipment. How to use engineering controls and other equipment that's designed to uh, prevent exposure to the um, to the employees itself. Uh, how to respond to a uh, known or suspected uh, hazardous drug exposure, uh, and then spill management, and also, uh, again, the disposal of the hazardous drugs themselves. So you're gonna need to train your employees on all those, and then after that is after that training is done, that employee needs to basically prove they understand um, uh, that how this all works. So they're gonna have to show a uh, show, you know, whether it's you know a hazardous drug manager, or whatever you may call them, uh, show that person that they know how to do all that stuff. And then training also needs to be performed on an annual basis. So receiving, um, you know, this is the first time that the hazardous drug is actually going to come into the pharmacy, obviously. Um, Ideally, you always want to receive uh, your hazard drugs in impervious uh, plastic to uh, prevent exposure, you know, spills in the pharmacy itself. Uh, you may want to work with your uh, vendors to ensure that they are uh, uh, segregating hazardous drugs. While it's not a requirement that they get segregated, um, you know, if you can work with your wholesaler to ensure that your hazardous drugs are seg segregated into their own tote, uh, that will make it easier on your employees. But you have your receiving, so you're going to receive that drug. Your employees need to be wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment um, when they unpack that. And there needs to be a spill kit um, uh, accessible in that area. So if there was a spill, an employee could uh, easily go grab that uh, spill kit and then, you know, start the process of cleaning that up. Now, if you do receive packages um, that... Um, you need to examine all your packages to make sure there's no damage or leakage. Um, if there is uh, damage or leakage, uh, ideally what you want to do is return that to the sender um, as, as soon as possible. Um, if, they, if you cannot do that or they're not going to accept it, uh, basically you need to start the process for handling the spill itself. So you can want to try to seal um, and try to return any damaged goods. Um, and again, if you cannot place, um, if you cannot return it, uh, you want a clear process to uh, start the process of limiting exposure. And then once you do um, receive those drugs and everything's fine, uh, but you want to immediately put that into your hazardous drug storage areas um, after you do unpack it. So once you do receive the drugs, you know, it, it's important to make sure that um, they're appropriately, appropriately labeled, packaged, and then they're, they're, they're ready for transport to another section of the pharmacy. Um, you know, so ideally, or not ideally, what you need to do is make sure those hazardous drugs are clearly labeled to inform employees, employees they are hazardous. So that may be uh, putting a sticker on them or somehow otherwise segregating them so uh, your employees are going to uh, be clearly aware that it is hazardous. I uh, do recommend a sticker. Sometimes, you know, drugs get mis 
uh, placed on the wrong shelf or or whatnot. So you know, if you have a shelf that's set aside for all your hazardous drugs, if if a drug for one reason or another gets placed on another shelf, uh, your employees may not be aware of that. So you know, using some sort of sticker system or something like that may be the best way to handle that. Um, now, one of the questions that we, we get a lot is what about the patients? You know, um, how, how how are we supposed to notify the patients that a particular drug is hazardous? Now, USP does not uh, provide any guidance on this. Um, you know, there, there, there's no official guidance from USP or, or really anybody else. Um, it is kind of recommend that you work on a drug by drug basis, but one of the important things to realize is, you know, letting a patient know or a caregiver know that a drug is hazardous is not always, um, is not always to the benefit of the patient themselves. It may, uh, uh, it may, make them not want to take it or even stop taking the, 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 the drug itself. So um, as of right now, there's there's no guidance from the USP on, on how to do that. So you want to check with your state to see if they have any requirements. Uh, if they do, you want to make sure you do follow those. Now, whenever you package a drug, uh, it needs to be packaged in a way to maintain the physical integrity, stability, and sterility if, if necessary, if it is a sterile compound. Uh, uh, you know, while, while it's being moved in the pharmacy or even outside the pharmacy. So if you are shipping that, you want to make sure that, you know, whatever you do package in is durable enough to, uh, you know, protect the, the hazardous drug from, you know, damage, leakage, contamination, degradation, and so forth. Um, and when you do ship it outside the pharmacy, you do want to make sure that you follow the, the protocols uh, of the carrier or the shipper uh, themselves, which will uh, they'll understand the appropriate federal and state and local regulations. So, um, you know, a lot of cases what this is going to mean is um, you put in the SDS sheet on there inside that package and you uh, put them in there in such a way, the drug in there in such a way that it's going to prevent the spillage that may be put in a plastic bag. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, if anybody that... Um, has maybe seen a process that a, a mail order pharmacy goes through. Um, if they are shipping out a hazardous drug, they typically put that in a yellow bag or a brown bag and then label that drug as hazardous. So, you know, everybody knows that, you know, if, if they do see a spill, um, you know, the box breaks and the, the, the bag falls out and it spills, everybody knows that it is hazardous. Now, it's also obviously important to make sure that you are properly disposing of hazardous drug waste. Um, so when we talk about what is hazardous drug waste, you know, it's going to be the actual uh, equipment that you may have used if you're disposing of the equipment, the supplies, personal protective equipment, and so forth. Now, according to the uh, EPA, uh, empty vials um, that you dispensed are not considered hazardous. Uh, now, your local, local, state, or federal EPA may have some different rules, but federally, an empty uh, vial is not considered hazardous. Um, one thing to realize, and this is why I, I, you have to work with a uh, hazardous waste disposal company, is you know there are rules on you know actual how much hazardous waste you're allowed to dispose of in a given month, um, before other rules start to apply, um, and then that's part of the Resource uh, Conservation and Recovery Act. So when you work with a hazardous waste disposal company, they'll kind of uh, walk you through that and uh, provide you with the bins that you need, um, so they can come pick it up uh, on what it is, and they'll also work with you to identify you know what hazardous drugs are what. Um, you know, there's different levels. Some are uh, hazardous waste is acute, uh, while some hazardous waste is non-acute, and they'll kind of walk you through that entire process. So, you know, it's something that you need to uh, make sure you're aware of. Um, and in a lot of cases, you can also just uh, use your reverse uh, distributor to return hazardous drugs. But again, you'll want to check with them to make sure they do uh, actually handle that. Now, for many of you on the call today, you probably um, are not compounding with hazardous drugs, uh, but you know if your state or your accreditation organization still requires you to be USP 800 compliant, um, you know there there is a process you need to go through. Uh, just for the dispensing of final dosage forms. Um, and basically a final dosage form is, you know, basically a product that doesn't need any further manipulation other than counting and repackaging uh, and have no further, you know, containment or handling requirements. So uh, tablets, capsules, creams, ointments that, you know, you're not going to be opening them um, during the dispensing process other than counting. Um, you know, so for that, you need to make sure that you wear appropriate personal protective equipment um, and that only clean equipment is used when you're when you're doing this, and it's decontaminated after each use. So, you know, if you use a uh, uh, your tray spatula to count, you know, 30 warfarin, you know, after that is done, you need to clean that spatula in that tray before you start counting any other drugs. Uh, it is recommended that you set 
um, very dedicated equipment when it comes to uh, the hazardous drugs themselves, just so that kind of just prevents uh, further um, contamination in the environment itself. Um, now, tablets and capsule forms of anti-neoplastic hazardous drugs must not be placed in automated counting or packaging machines. So if a drug does fall into that group one, uh, you're gonna have to count that on the tray. You cannot use an automated counting or packaging machine. Now this is where we get to another misconception out there. Technically, you are um, allowed to use a um, automated counting or packaging machine for any group two, non-antineoplastic or group three reproductive risk only drugs. Um, but you'll need to have an assessment of risk on how you're going to uh, limit uh, the overall contamination there. So um, basically what that means is after each use, you're gonna have to clean that uh, automated counting machine or packaging machine. Uh, so we don't necessarily recommend that, um, but USP itself um, uh, states that you can do this in their FAQ area um, of their website. But again, um, not something that I'd probably be doing in my pharmacy. I would probably just continue to use the, the spatula and counting tray. And obviously for most of you, the pharmacies that are just dispensing uh, capsules and tablets, uh, you're probably going to do an assessment of risk on most of those anyways that will help the process of addressing any sort of personal protective equipment and containment requirements for those drugs now. Again, you don't need to do an assessment of risk, in which case you just need to follow um, uh, what USP 800 guidelines state, uh, but if you do that assessment of risk, that may help you with your employees um, uh, through the process of actually um, you know, handling those hazardous drugs in a way that's uh, a little bit more uh, appropriate for your operation. Now, compounding is where we start to see some of the uh, the most requirements or, or most uh, likely set of risks when it comes to exposure of hazardous drugs. So again, um, you know, if you are doing compounding, uh, USP 800 says that you need to follow uh, 795 and 797 requirements. So you do need to follow those. Uh, you need to have appropriate personal protective equipment. And any sort of equipment used for um, a hazardous drug compounding must be dedicated for that hazardous drug compounding and cleaned after use. Um, if you are using plastic back mats, um, you know, they should be cleaned or changed um, uh, immediately if a spill occurs and then regularly during the course of uh, the workday and always should be dis uh, discarded at the end of the day. So, um, you know, throughout the day, if you don't, do not have a spill or something like that, you know, uh, there is going to be a buildup on of uh, hazardous drugs on that mat. So you want to dispose of that appropriately uh, throughout the day itself. Um, active pharmaceutical ingredients and any other powdered hazardous drugs, uh, they need to be handled in one of those primary engineering controls. Um, basically, that is to prevent any sort of, um, uh, you know, the, during the act of, you know, crushing tablets or opening capsules or weighing powders that, you know, there's in contamination into the environment itself. And then one thing about, you know, uh, with 795 and 797, uh, you do want to make sure you actually are using the, the proper standards. And that's the 795 is the 2014 version and 797 is the 2008 version. Um, once USP announces that the 2019 versions of these are have gone through the appeals process, um, they've stated there will be at least six months before they go into effect. So you, again, you want to continue using uh, the 2019 ver 2014 version of 795 and the 2008 version of 795. Now, for most of you, you're not going to be administering hazardous drugs um, in, in your pharmacy, but um, you want to go through the process. If you are doing that, uh, you want to uh, administer in a, in a safe way that prevents exposure to your employees. So for those um, that are doing administering your crushing tablets or opening capsules, you know, whether it's in a patient room or in a, a, a room, uh, you know, a, a counseling room or a treatment room, uh, you want to make sure you do that in a plastic pouch or something like that to prevent um, exposure to the employees themselves. And if you are going to be uh, transferring hazardous drugs into a, a a IV system or something like that, you always want to make sure you use a closed system drug transfer device uh, to kind of prevent um, the exposure of the hazardous drugs into the environment itself. And any sort of manipulation of the hazardous drug itself, and that, that includes crushing and splitting tablets, uh, really should not occur. Uh, but again, use that plastic pouch or uh, use a liquid form if, if possible. And then of course, you know, personal protective equipment needs to be worn according to the, uh, the USP 800 requirements. And any sort of contaminated equipment or um, supplies that you may have used need, needs to be disposed of as if it is hazardous waste. 
So when it comes to um, the cleanup of your um, you know, equipment or if there's a spill, USP has a very uh, has a process that that this has to go through, and it's you know deactivation, um, uh, which is basically going to render a uh, drug inert or inactive, uh, decontaminating, which is going to remove the hazardous drug residue from an area, uh, the cleanup, which is going to clean, you know, any sort of uh, items that we have left over from deactivation, decontamination, and then if we are doing sterile compounding, disinfection of the area, make sure that um that we are disinfecting that area, um, you know, so there's no uh, microbial growth or, you know, fungal growth or anything like that. Um, so for deactivation itself, um, you know, basically what you need to be using for the deactivation is uh, anything that may be on the hazardous drug label um, uh, or SDS sheet, or you can use um, an EPA registered oxidizer which may include some peroxide formulations, uh, bleach, etc. Now, if you are using bleach itself, um, it is important that you uh, actually deactivate the bleach itself because, um, you know, that, that's something that um, that needs to occur. And, and there's a couple different compounds that can be used for that, whether it's, uh, you know, sodium theosulfite, sodium sulfite, things like that uh, will actually deactivate the bleach. So you want to make sure that, um, that you, if you are using a bleach solution that you um, that you deactivate that bleach. You know, for decontamination, you know, you can technically use uh, alcohol, water, peroxide, or bleach again, uh, but you'd want to make sure that, again, if you are using bleach, that you do deactivate that. You know, for the cleaning process, you know, you can use sterile water or some other uh, uh, product that's going to remove organic or inorganic materials. And then if you are um, a sterile compounding, you want to disinfect the area, you know, you can use any um, uh, EPA registered disinfectant uh, and or sterile alcohol. Uh, as appropriate for that particular use. Uh, one thing you do always want to keep in mind uh, when you are um, handling, uh, when you are using uh, some of these agents is make sure that the surface that you are cleaning is compatible with that area. Um, you know, stainless steel and bleach don't necessarily get along very well. Um, so you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you use the appropriate, um, uh, the appropriate product for the actual surface that you're trying to clean uh, to make sure you don't damage that surface, especially in a sterile setting. So obviously, um, you know, it, there's always a chance that a spill may happen, um, and you need to make sure that you're really prepared for that spill. So that, that's, that's a two-part process. First, make sure you have spill kits available. Um, so make sure that, you know, those spill kits can handle the type of spills that you may have. Um, and also, possibly, well, not more important, but uh, also very important, it's that, um, with USB 800 standards, you're not even permitted to handle hazardous drugs uh, in your pharmacy unless there is a trained employee um, uh, present in the pharmacy itself, just in case a spill does occur. So if one of your employees is trained, if you only have one employee trained to handle, handle the spill of hazardous drugs, then if they're not there, then you're not able to handle hazardous drugs while they're not there. So um, it's important to make sure you're aware of that. And if you are required to be USB and are compliant, that you at least have uh, someone there um, at all times. So you may want to train multiple people or everybody to handle hazardous drug spills. Now, the general process of a hazardous drug uh, spill um, is, you know, you want to evacuate the area. Make sure you get any individuals out there, uh, uh, especially anybody that may be pregnant out of a, uh, a spill area. You want to secure the area. Make sure that everybody knows that this area is um, is, is currently contaminated and nobody should be in here that may be putting up placards or other warnings to uh, let employees or individuals know to uh, not enter the area. You want to perform first aid uh, and contact the emergency services if there has been some sort of actual exposure. You want to identify the hazardous drug um, that was um, that was spilled. Um, you want to collect a spill kit, obviously. Um, and then as you identify the hazardous drug itself, that'll also uh, allow you to know what kind of um, uh, compounds can be used to actually clean up that spill, spill itself. You want to put on the appropriate personal protective equipment and then start the, the, the cleanup process. So, you know, you can think of this as a couple different ways. Um, it, you know, if the uh, hazard drug was in glass and that glass broke, you want to make sure you get rid of that glass and then start the process of actually cleaning up any sort of powder or liquid that may be in the area. And then you want to dispose of all that um, as appropriate. Uh, and you're in uh, instructions on your spill kit will go over that process on uh, typically there's multiple bags on there and they'll tell you exactly how to use each bag um, you know for that particular spill kit uh, 
Um, once you've cleaned up the area and disposed of the waste, uh, you're going to go through a process of actually documenting the spill and investigating the spill to actually see what happened. Um, so you're going to document the spill itself, uh, document your investigation of the events leading up to the spill, and then based on that, you're going to make any changes to your uh, policies, procedures, practices, trainings, or anything like that to uh, prevent a similar spill from happening in the future. A lot of times, it's it's not necessarily preventable, um, but you know when it is preventable, you want to make sure you do everything you can to actually prevent that spill. So in section 17, it talks about uh, the documentation and standard operating procedures. Basically, this is a list of um, actually kind of reflects all the standards we've almost all went, went through. Uh, there's only one left. Um, but basically, uh, you need to have a, a set of policies and procedures, or what USP typically calls a standard operating procedure, to uh, cover the process of, of how you handle hazardous drugs uh, in the pharmacy setting. So you know, as this is pretty much everything that we already went over, um, everybody's going to copy the slide so you can read over that when you get it. Um, but I'm not going to read through that list. Uh, the last standard that USP has is the medical surveillance standard, and this is another uh, uh, standard that has a, a should associated with it. Um, now, if you are handling a lot of hazardous drugs in your pharmacy, especially if you're doing compounding uh, and things like that, uh, USP says you should have medical surveillance, uh, and during that medical surveillance, you're going to do a baseline and then follow up surveillance on those individuals. Now, what they're basically saying there is you know, ultimately, um, you're going to, you should test your uh, employees, you know, get a, a baseline blood test to look at their thyroid levels, their kidney levels, their liver level, levels, and things like that. You know, it all depends on what hazardous drugs you're using, but you're going to get a baseline test. And who's going to determine what that baseline test should be? It's really going to be either a healthcare practitioner, and that may be one that you like, that you're contracted with. Uh, you know, there are employer, uh, 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 employer health programs out there that, you know, they, that's, that's kind of what they do. Uh, but you can also work with uh, your uh, employee's own uh, medical uh, practitioners. I typically recommend you find a uh, contract healthcare provider, but, you know, you could work with the employees. Uh, but anyways, you're going to perform this baseline test based on the drugs you have. Um, and then every six months, three months, one year, depending on uh, what that healthcare practitioner says, you're going to do follow-up. Uh, test on these individuals to make sure that you know th that we're not seeing any evidence of drug exposure. You know, maybe their thyroid levels are going up or down. And if you have many employees that are um, on this uh, are in this process, then uh, you may notice some trends. You may notice that all your employees their uh, thyroid levels are going up, and there's no explanation as to why that is. And what this is going to allow you to do is kind of catch anything that you may not be noticing um, in the pharmacy itself. You may not notice spills or things like that, and it's just a buildup of hazardous drugs. Now, again, that is a should. Um, now, what is not a should is, you know, if you do have a spill or exposure, or if you have an exposure, uh, basically you need to treat that employee. Um, so employees should be under the care of the healthcare provider if they've been exposed to a drug. And then you want to conduct an investigation of the practices, engineering controls, uh, and other factors that may have led up to that exposure itself. And obviously, if you know the employee is uh, hurt from a potential exposure, you know your work, you want to make sure you follow your workers' comp and any state laws that that would apply to that. Um, so that covers all the standards. Um, here's a couple links to uh, everything that I mentioned. You know, you can get a copy of the USB 800 general chapter. Um, at that link there, it's going to ask you for some information to download it. Otherwise, I would send you a copy, but it does ask you for your name and email address and all that stuff. Um, the NIOSH list, and this is the link for the current 2016 version. Um, as soon as the 2019 version is is out, you know, we'll we'll have a, a, a link to that on our website. Uh, and if you have our our USB 800 track program, our compliance program for USB 800, obviously that program will be updated um, when the new list comes out. And then if you need more information on the handling of um, management of pharmaceutical waste, uh, here's the EPA website for that. That's kind of going to kind of go over all of that information. Okay, so I want to talk about next steps. You know, what are the next steps if you're working towards uh, USP 800 compliance. You know, first and foremost, you, you, you want to check with your state board of pharmacy or accreditation organization to see if they're actually going to require you um, to be compliant 
uh, once you've determined that they are requiring to be compliant, you want to make sure you designate leadership, someone uh, or a group that's going to be responsible for the overall process, um, and they can come up with a game plan when it comes to when it comes to um, actually becoming compliant itself. You want to make sure that leadership uh, reads the USP 800 standards and the um, the 800 standards themselves, and that they read the NIOSH list of the Antonia plastic and other hazardous drugs in the healthcare setting. You know, so you really want to make sure that they're 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 going through and uh, aware of what those standards are. They attend webinars like this, go to CEs, um, and obviously know what hazardous drugs are. Um, obviously, you're going to go through and identify your hazardous drugs, uh, collect safety data sheets for each drug, and then you want to document their location in the pharmacy itself. Um, you want to identify how your hazardous drugs are received, moved, stored, and handled throughout the pharmacy itself. You want to make sure you obtain all the required personal protective equipment. So in general, you're going to, you're going to grab all the equipment that uh, USP 800 requires, and then you're going to you know, put that in place to make sure employees are aware of how to handle that. Um, you're going to determine if it's safe and appropriate to, to create an assessment of risk for specific drugs. And, you know, again, if you're um, you know, you're counting Paxil's, Paxil, you know, paroxetine, uh, tamoxifen, in low enough volumes, you may want to, um, you know, tweak what the, the standard uh, personal protective equipment requirements are for, for that process. So you want to create an assessment of risk. Uh, you want to determine if you can do any environmental wiping. You know, in most cases, if you're just your average dispensing pharmacy, it's probably not something that you're going to do. Uh, you want to make sure you designate your pro appropriate areas for hazardous drug, including signage. Now, again, for most pharmacies um, that aren't doing compounding, you know, these hazardous drugs for the most part can be stored in your general population. Uh, but you want to make sure that you, you you document where that is, and employees know that you know in this area we are storing hazardous drugs. So just be aware. And then you want to make sure all your hazardous drugs are clearly labeled. Again, I recommend a sticker system for that. But you know, if you have another way of doing that. Um, you can do that. You want to make sure you obtain and place spill kits near your hazardous drug areas. Um, so in each of those areas, you want to make, make sure there is a spill kit available. So you may have multiple spill kits. A lot of pharmacies may just have one. Um, you know, your average dispensary pharmacy may just have one spill kit because for the most part, we're all one. It's all one area. Um, you want to contact and discuss with your reverse distributor to see how they're going to handle hazardous drugs. Some of them may not handle it. Some may handle them. Um, so they're, they're all going to have their own little process of, of how they do that. Uh, you want to contact a local hazardous waste disposal company. Um, if you do not have a local one, then you can uh, contact uh, waste management or Stericycle or someone like that that uh, will be able to handle any sort of hazardous waste that you come up with. Uh, obviously, determine if you're going to be going going to perform a uh, baseline medical surveillance, and then you also want to train your employees on uh, USP 800 and all your policies, procedures, and standard operating practice.